Good afternoon, I'm Jason Residlo, reporting outside the Motor City Casino Hotel in downtown Detroit for the 2017 Cranes Newsmaker of the Year Ceremony. This year's honoree is Lear Corporation CEO Matt Simoncini. You're, you're, you're leaving your successor in great hands. Lear is strong, it's rich, you've experienced tremendous growth, lots of cash on hand, good controls in place. Right. Um, Let's talk about the future of Lear and the future of mobility. Where does a seating company fit into this new technology change? Well, I think we're in a perfect position for the, many of the reasons that you, you mentioned, Casey. But if you think about a seat for a minute, and many, let's say, mechanical components in time, they evolve, right? They become intelligent. We're seeing the same thing with the seat. So if you think about connectivity, you're connected to your seat. It's a safety product, but it's also a product that can transfer information both from the car uh, to the driver to the occupant, but from the occupant back to the car that can be useful. So we think it's a natural place to be in the cabin, and it's also a big driver on the purchasing decision of a vehicle, your seat, right? You, the comfort of your seat. So things like biometrics, personal sound zones, um, heating and cooling into your, to your body temperatures, being able to take an EKG while you're sitting in the car. So if you're driving and you get into a conversation, your blood, pressure, might, your blood pressure gets higher, <laughs> they might say, hey, it's time to calm down. So there's a lot of different things we can do. And what's unique about Lear Corporation, because we are the best seat maker in the world. <laughs> is we also have an electronics division that writes a lot of the code. We have over 600 software engineers at, at Lear Corporation. So the car is becoming a rolling smart device. Um, you need to be able to transfer information and write code. We're the only seat maker that can do that. So um, that's why I think I'm extremely high on Lear's future. The best days of Lear Corporation are truly in front of us. From an industry perspective, this is obviously a time of unprecedented change, but it's also a time of unprecedented opportunity for this industry and for Detroit and for the state of Michigan. For years, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier today, we talked about the need to diversify the state. We need to get away from automotive. The automotive industry is the largest industry in the world. We have the largest hub of automotive expertise and business in the world here in the Tri-County area, and the industry is leading in things like connectivity, alternate energy vehicles, mobility, artificial intelligence. We're diversifying just by, by being part of the automotive industry, and I think it's just a great time to be in the space, it's a great time to be in Detroit, it's a great time to be um, in the state of Michigan, and it's an outstanding time to be part of Lear Corporation. <laughs> yeah. I have some questions on what's next, but that did sound mm -hmm. awfully, uh, a lot like <laughs> a platform, if you will. Um, let, let's just stick on here, though, for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it possible that, that seating companies become uh, a benchmark for innovation? Are you oh. talking about the, the, an EKG I, I in your seat? I, I absolutely think. Look, innovation is going to come from a lot of different ways. I mean, who would have thought 20 years ago that the mirror would be a safety device that could deliver information? That was an innovation that, that's come through in the recent uh, 20 years. I think the seat also, when you look at it, not only is it comfort, it's also a safety product. So think about a seat that anticipates a crash and puts you in a safer position before impact or can absorb energy in a crash. So I think the seat will be the next level of innovation that you're going to see in the cabin. Um. You know, you, you, there's so much M&A going on in mm -hmm. auto right now. And when you look at what's happening in, in Tel Aviv and Silicon Valley and Warren, Michigan, um, what, what kind of a role does acquisition play in the future for Lear? I think it's great. Acquisitions can be great. They can also be the reason why companies file bankruptcy when they're not done in a financially disciplined manner or do not provide the return. So I think we always have to be conscious of, for the shareholders, what's the return on an investment. But I do believe if you're smart with your investment on startups, the innovation we need in the auto industry, we need at Lear, is largely out there. It just hasn't been applied to automotive. So when you go to places like Tel Aviv, you're leapfrogging, if you will, years of development 
that have already been spent. Maybe the development's been in aerospace, military, maybe it's been in consumer products, but it gives you a chance to kind of speed up your innovation. And what we bring as a company besides balance sheet is knowing how to apply that technology to automotive. So I think it is a good partnership. Um, I am. A, is me? there a gap right now that Lear's looking to fill? I think we are where we need to be, but we're always looking to get more um, capabilities in software and in code that will allow for better positioning of the vehicle, understanding how to transfer data in a more secure manner. Um, you know, Casey, if you would have told me six years ago when I started as CEO that we would have a cybersecurity office in Ann Arbor, you know, I would have thought you were crazy, but this is the world that we're in today. So we're constantly trying to get better on managing information. The information will be a revenue stream. It's not yet, at least not for the auto uh, automakers, but it will be. And that revenue stream will be as important as the manufacturing. As, as folks are trying more and more to commoditize uh, the components that are in cars, mm -hmm. Do you see consolidation happening in the interior space as well? Can you guys well, it needs to. dominate even more? Um, yes, the answer is yes. We, we're just starting to dominate. Um, consolidation is good if it's done for the right reason. What's bad is financial engineering. Splitting up companies because you can get a different multiple, which makes the company weaker or, or doesn't have the expertise spreading the wealth, that's bad. So this financial engineering, in my opinion, is not a positive trend. What is a positive trend is being more efficient, and a lot of times consolidation allows you to be more efficient because it's squeezing out waste and, and utilizing excess capacity. So I think in certain cases, consolidation is good, and I think we're gonna see consolidation continue to happen, not just in the supply community, but also with the OEs. Comparing that, however, to companies that are, in the past, we would separate multi-industry companies and we would break up the diversification way. Now what we're seeing is they're asking for that to be done for companies that have several products in the same industry. That's the difference and ultimately what you're left with is, is short-term gains in two companies that are weaker. You've been at Lear a long time. You've accomplished a lot at Lear. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you have any unfinished business? Well, you always feel like you have unfinished business and things that you would like to have gotten to, things that you would have done differently, Ray, things that you Ray's would do better. Ray's smiling over here. I think he, you left him a long list from what I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I am leaving in peace knowing that this team is an outstanding team. They deserve all the credit for what's happened at Lear Corporation. They deserve all the credit for the philanthropic work that many times I get the recognition for. Um, and I, yes, there is more I'd like to do, but in the same token, I think um, a lot of times in these positions, Casey, and you and I have spoken about this, people stay too long. Thanks, Casey. Thank you. Thank you. This fallacy that we don't have an educated workforce is just that. It's a fallacy. At Lear Corporation, we make seats in India, um, electrical harnesses in the Philippines, and we're able to teach individuals on how to make seats for BMW and wire harnesses for Ford. All around the world, we can do that, and we can definitely do that in the city of Detroit. So I don't buy in the process that we don't have an educated workforce. We do. We have an available and educated workforce we don't have the jobs. What are some of the drawbacks? We have to find a solution to coexist with organized labor. Organized labor needs a seat at the table. Unfortunately, we're up against a $5 labor market right across our border. So it's a tough and difficult economic equation because no one, not the companies and not organized labor, want to be viewed as taking advantage of those that are less fortunate. We've got to figure out a way to break that equation to make it economically viable because we cannot subsidize it. The car companies are in a price sensitive product as we are. We need to find that solution and we need to establish manufacturing again in the city of Detroit. And I think we can, it's just gonna take a little bit more work. So let's stay on Detroit for a minute. Um, you mentioned in the press conference the need for mass transit. You've talked about education. Mm -hmm. Are there any other big points, or do you want to elaborate on those two, specifically why you keep talking about them? Well, I think they go hand in hand, um, because they're about 
part of an infrastructure that makes a city great. We're all planning to flag um, and we're proud of the resurgence of the city of Detroit, as we should be. It's been an amazing turnaround. But can we truly be a great city if we can't educate our kids through public education? And whether it's a combination of the DPS and charters, private parochial schools, we need to have an ecosystem that allows a child to go to school and get an education. Walk to school in their neighborhood, if you will, and get an education that would allow them to get into universities like the University of Michigan, Wayne State University, my, my alma mater. <laughs> We also need to be able to get people to jobs. And right now to have two uncoordinated bus lines in the city of Detroit and very few routes that extend beyond eight mile or the city limits is to me just ridiculous. And if anybody tells you otherwise or tries to make a rule about the underserved cities and what have you, I, I just think it's, it's being very parochial. We need to come together as a community and solve this equation. And by the way, it's not that hard of an equation to solve. It just has to start with a willingness and an understanding that we need to have mass transportation. We should be able to take a train to Ann Arbor. We should be able to take a bus to Metro Airport. We should be able to get um, students after school from Pontiac and be able to bring them down to the jobs at Lear Corporation on Aiden Telegraph. This is unacceptable. And we need to call out the political leadership and tell them that. <clears throat> Anything else you'd like to tell them? Now that you've got, you got a stage here in a room full of people that are all here to support you. Well, you know, I've got a lot of great ideas. I just don't stick around long enough to execute them. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got a last day at Lear coming up. I do. You're going to get out of town for a little bit. I am. Put on some flip-flops. <laughs> Well, <laughs> okay. We're going to come back to Detroit. Detroit's my home. And then what? Well, I, you know, what's been the hardest part about leaving, or one of the hardest things about leaving, is answering the question why you're leaving, but also the, the, the follow on question is what are you going to do? I'm 57. I've always had a job. I worked for my dad when I was uh, 13, 14 year olds washing tools. He was a cement man. So I've always had that level of structure in my life. and, and for the first time in my life, I won't have structure um, and um, I won't have a plan. <laughs> you know, I don't have a plan. I really don't know. I know this. I've lived all around the world, um, but I've always hit, come back home to Detroit. Detroit's my home. I will be involved in the community on philanthropic efforts. Um, I will work I very hard. I think you hard. just joined a board here at I lunch. Did, yeah. <laughs> I did, yeah. Uh, um, my shoulder still hurts. <laughs> I, I don't know, Casey. I, I, I know, um, I, I don't think, you know, everybody says, well, you're going to miss it. Yeah, I will. I, I don't ever see being a CEO again in the cards, ever. I work for the greatest company on the face of the earth. It would be hard to join another one. Um, you're, you're good at this, just so you know. <laughs> Are you, have you thought about politics? <laughs> Dead <laughs> serious. The question is people that, ask me. This is, here's my thoughts. We got about on 450 politics. votes. I know right uh, here. Brian, Brian left, so I'll be honest now. <laughs> 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 I'm honored as a Detroit public school kid, as a kid that's been thrown out of more schools than you would ever want to count. <laughs> in fact, a pretty good one in East Lansing, which was pretty traumatic um, at the time. Uh, I'm honored to be thought of as a viable candidate and uh, by people I respect. But the reality is, you know, I'm outspoken, uh, I'm Passionate. used to, yeah. I, there's a lot of skills that don't play well, quite frankly. <laughs> And, uh, Where have I heard another CEO that just took a uh, political job somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> and look how well he's doing. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'd be hard pressed to think that I'd ever uh, be in a, in, in a political arena. I mean, I don't want to spend half my time raising money from friends. <laughs>